As scientists learned more and more about the world around us and about what materials are made out of, we started to find all of these elements and we learned all the properties of the elements. We knew that gold had different properties from carbon, we knew that carbon had different properties from nitrogen, and we could figure out which elements reacted together well, and we learned about their masses, we learned about all kinds of things. However, we didn't have a really good way to organize these elements together. Like, imagine if you're trying to learn chemistry and you go to a textbook and the elements are just listed alphabetically. They haven't been grouped together based on similar properties at all. It would be very hard to just memorize lists upon lists of facts about every single element and what they react with. And that was really the situation that a lot of chemists were dealing with. Chemistry had to be memorized. It could not be understood. And one big step to making chemistry a science that could be understood was when this gentleman, Dmitry Mendeleev, decided to organize the elements in a very particular way. Mendeleev had uh, struck up a deal to write a textbook. So he was going to be paid to write a textbook, and he realized that probably the simplest way to summarize all of the information that we had about elements really quick was to put in a table but how to arrange them, right? That is the question. So what he did was he took a bunch of note cards, like index cards, like you're probably using to study with, and he wrote down the names of the chemical elements and every property he could think of on them, and he sort of dealt them out in front of them. He shuffled them around, moved them about, and tried to play a kind of chemical solitaire with himself until he could see patterns emerging. And Mendeleev had memorized the properties of the elements probably better than any other chemist of his time. So he was uniquely suited to this type of task. And when he had completed his task, he had made something that wasn't just a nice organizational way to look at chemistry. He actually had managed to describe the very structure of the atoms he was working with. He didn't even believe in atoms. He hated the idea of atoms, and yet his table could tell us about the structure of those materials. So how did that happen? How did he do that? So I've been working on this little animation here uh, in order to try to give you an idea of why he put the elements where they were and to show you what I mean when I say chemistry can be understood, not just memorized. So for starters, he took all of the elements that he had written down on his index cards and he arranged them by mass and it looked like this. Now we have discovered a lot more elements since then but these are the ones he was aware of at the time. That number written at the bottom of the card is how much an atom of that particular element weighs and then the uh, letters is what we call the chemical symbol for that element. So hydrogen is H, lithium is Li, beryllium is Be, boron is B, carbon is C. A lot of them make sense in that way. Some of them don't make sense unless you know the Latin uh, roots. So uh, uh, lead is Pb, that stands for plumbus because it used to be used in plumbing. It's the same root as plumbing. In fact, we still use it in our pipes much more than we probably should. Mercury is Hg for hydrogerum. So some of them make sense and some of them you just have to memorize. The good news is that uh, the ones that we use in biology are mostly the ones that make sense. So good news there. And you can see that the lightest element, hydrogen, is at the top left, and then the next lightest element that he knew about, lithium, is right next to it, and then beryllium and boron and carbon, and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier as we go. And then when you get to the end of one row, we start over again on the next row down at the far left and move our way right, just like reading any sentence on a page. So that was the first way that he organized them. Then he started to look for certain properties that these elements had in common. Now these properties that I'm going to list here are not necessarily the exact same ones that he used, but the pattern still holds. So here are all of the elements that form plus one ions, positive ions, when you mix them up in solution. You can see that they're periodically placed throughout this system. Hmm, periodic, that's an interesting word. They're periodically placed, elements with this kind of property. Next, here's all the elements that form plus two ions, even more positive ions in solution. And they're also periodically placed. In fact, they're repeating in a pattern. Look at this. Red, orange, gray. Red, orange, gray. Red, orange, gray. Red, orange, gray. Now, the length of gray is different every time, but you get this pattern of red, orange, gray. These elements are repeating themselves. So, what happens if we 
add some more ideas here. Well, these are the transition metals here, metals that you're familiar with, iron and chrome and nickel and, and all of these kind of things. Oh, well, that seems to break the pattern. Or does it? Or does it just add a little layer of complexity to the pattern? Because now it goes red, orange, gray, red, orange, gray, red, orange, yellow, gray, red, orange, yellow, gray, red, orange, yellow, gray. Okay, so it just actually uh, makes the pattern become a little bit more complicated as we go. Well, let's keep going here. We're going to move from the transition metals and we're going to add in the metalloids. And now you can see that the pattern is maintained. It goes red, orange, blue, gray, and then down here it becomes red, orange, yellow, blue, gray. Okay, what about the non-metals, and uh, how about some of these elements that form negative ions? We've got the positive ions, so let's get the negative ions in here. And then he added in what we call the post-transition metals, so these are in there as well. And like I said, these are not necessarily the exact same properties that he was looking at, but uh, the pattern still holds. It's still the kind of pattern he was looking at. So then he asked himself this question. Is there a way that he could arrange these elements such that their order is maintained, that we're still going from the lightest element, hydrogen, up to the heaviest element that he knows about, bismuth down here, Bi-209, but which also groups them together with similar properties, or as similar as they can possibly be. So then he took his cards and he arranged them like this. It's starting to look familiar, isn't it? It's starting to look familiar. You've probably seen this on the wall of a science classroom. This is the starting of the periodic table of the elements. Now you can see hydrogen is way up at top, that's the light one, and bismuth is way down here at the bottom. And if you move from left to right and then down a column every time you run out of elements, that you're still going from the lightest up to the heaviest, but now they've been arranged in these nice columns so that similar types of elements are grouped together. Now, Mendeleev was not the first scientist to notice that the properties of elements repeated as you went uh, in increasing mass, but what really made his table stand out compared to every other attempt to organize these elements was that he left these blanks. You see these dark areas here? Let me fill them in. Yeah, fill them in with these question marks right here, he realized that the reason why the pattern didn't hold perfectly was that there were simply elements that we hadn't discovered yet. So he put in these blank areas for elements that we might find later, and he made predictions about the properties of those elements. He said, this one will weigh this much, and it'll have these kinds of properties. It'll have, you know, it'll be this good at conducting electricity. It'll form these kinds of ions. It'll do this. It'll do that. He made predictions about elements that we'd find. And you know what? Chemists went out, they searched everywhere where they could, and they found his missing elements. We filled in these parts of the table. Now, this element right here, uh, right below aluminum, he called it eca-aluminum, which means the element which comes after aluminum. But the guy who actually went out and found a sample of it, well, his name was Francois Lecoq de Baudran, and he named it gallium, because gallia was a uh, kind of old Latin name for the area around France, so he was kind of naming it after his homeland, but secretly his name, Francois Lecoq de Baudrin, it me Lecoq means the rooster, and galliform, gallium, right, is the scientific name for chicken, so he sneakily named it after himself, which you're not supposed to do, naughty chemists. But anyway, he uh, characterized all of the properties of gallium once he had discovered it, and it turned out that Mendeleev's predictions about the properties of gallium were actually more accurate than uh, Lecoq de Baudrin's data, which he got from actually testing the physical material. Like, take a moment and think about how crazy that is. Mendeleev essentially sat down and came up with like a spreadsheet, a table that uh, helped him understand the properties of these elements. Lecoq de Baudrin actually had the physical material in front of them, but Mendeleev knew more about that element than the guy who actually had some on his desk. So this is uh, an indication of how powerful this periodic table really is. But oh no, here comes some trouble. We start to discover 
all of these elements that we didn't notice were there before. They're called noble gases. And the reason why they're called noble gases, like the nobility, the aristocracy, they don't uh, hang around, they don't interact with the riffraff, the, the, the common folk. Well, similarly, noble gases don't interact with other types of elements. They don't react with anything at all, really. And since chemists can't actually see atoms, they only know if they're there if they participate in chemical reactions. So we just kind of never noticed these noble gases, but we started to discover them. And look at this, helium, it's heavier than hydrogen, but it's lighter than lithium. So, oh no, what are we going to do in order to make these noble gases fit this table? Or do we have to throw the entire table away? Here's what we do. All these noble gases have properties in common with each other. So they are just another category of elements. We take the table and we add them on the side. We just create another column of the periodic table and actually it fits perfectly. So now the in order of mass, it goes hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, and then sodium, magnesium, and just goes on like that. Every single one of these noble gases fits perfectly into that slot. So if you've ever wondered why it is that the periodic table looks like a like an old castle or something like that, why there's these giant gaps, it's so that we can still list the elements in order of their mass while grouping them together with other elements that are similar. Just like how we didn't notice that the noble gases were around, we started to realize that uh, two of the elements that we had, lanthanum and actinium, uh, there was actually a bunch of different elements kind of mixed in with these ore deposits of those material. There's a whole category of elements that we had kind of missed. And if we included all of them in the exact same way that we've included all these other elements, we would actually have to spread out the table even more to make it look like this. And at this point, textbook publishers put their foot down. They said, no, that looks ridiculous. That is way too big uh, to fit on a textbook page. And we're not going to print a fold out in our, in our science textbooks, right? We, we'd have to have a fold out page on the inside of every single textbook that we publish for biology, for chemistry, for all these different things. And we're just not doing it. So in order to avoid that, instead of placing the lanthanides and the actinides where they're supposed to be, the rare earths, we instead place them just below the table, but they would properly fit in to that little slot right there. So if you've ever wondered why there's this little annex, this little rectangle down below the periodic table, that's why. So it'll fit neatly on a page. And there you have it. This is our modern periodic table as we currently understand it. The alkali metals are the ones on this far left-hand column right next to the alkaline earth metals. On the far right-hand column, you have the noble gases and the halogens right next to them. Transition metals in yellow here in the center. Now here's a secret that a lot of professors won't tell you about Mendeleev. He had to cheat in a couple places in order to make sure that uh, columns had similar properties to each other, every now and then he had to switch the place of two elements. The one that was uh, heavier actually precedes the one that was lighter. And in order to make this work, he came up with a kind of fudge factor that he uh, invented, which he called the atomic number. So it's pretty easy to figure out what an element's atomic number is. Hydrogen is the first element on this table. It has atomic number one. Helium has atomic number two. Lithium, atomic number three. Beryllium, atomic number four. And it was just sort of his way to make sure that the correct element went into the correct position on its table, even though most of them followed the rule of increasing mass. Every now and then he needed this atomic number to make it work. But what he didn't know was that the atomic number actually reflected a real physical property of these atoms. He was starting to describe subatomic structure even though he didn't like the idea of atoms. He really got us started on the right path to understanding those atoms. And I will tell you what the atomic number actually represents in the next video.